Okay. Good Friday morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Backyard Naturalist. Happy day after Thanksgiving. My name is Tim. I work at the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, but today I'm coming to you live from Skokie, Illinois, where I spent uh, Thanksgiving live and in person with family and friends. I hope you're finding reason to give thanks today uh, as we look at the natural and human history of a very important source of human sustenance, possibly and arguably the most important food in human history, I said arguably, uh, maize uh, to many in the world. And uh, this is lucky episode 13 of lucky season three of the Backyard Naturalist, the maze runner. And as you can see, the characters here are trying to get out of a maze maze. I'd like to give a shout out to um, two great sources of information for today's episode. One was Margaret Hardin's podcast, which I just discovered and I already love. It's called The History of American Food. And then also to the book 1491 by Charles Mann. And today I'm giving thanks to the wonderful Urban Ecology Center and Backyard Naturalist community who bring me joy every Friday morning year round. You are all wonderful human beings and I'm grateful to spend time with you. From the human phenology world, we are two days away from the beginning of Hanukkah or the Festival of Lights as a candle is lit each day for the subsequent eight days until December 6th of this year. Uh, December 8th is the Buddhist holiday known as Bodai Day, commemorating the day that the historical Buddha Shakyamuni resolved to sit under the Bodai tree known to botanists as Ficus religiosa, the religious fig, under which uh, he meditated until he found the root of suffering and figured out how to liberate oneself from suffering. December 10th marks Human Rights Day, uh, the anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 by the UN's General Assembly. And then there are also some astronomical events occurring for the next few weeks. Uh, we have the Geminid meteor shower, which peaks the evening of December 13th to the morning of December 14th. If you can deal with the cold, it's one of the best uh, meteor showers of the year. And then on December 19th, at 10.19 p.m., astronomical winter begins with the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year for those of us in the north, as the axis of rotation of the Earth reaches the farthest point from the sun. Um, after December 19th, it will stay colder for those of us in the north, but the days will be getting longer as we slowly experience more direct sunlight day by day. So on to the story of corn. And like any good story, this one starts with once upon a time, there was a kingdom called the plant kingdom with many species, both beautiful and terrifying, gigantic and tiny, useful and yummy. And in that kingdom, there lived a grass, a seemingly ordinary grass called Teosinte. So ordinary, in fact, that it is in the same family as the very ordinary turf grass that graces many lawns around the world. But turf grass is the basis of another story from another time back in season two that we can retell again some other morning. Teosinte lived a simple life and had a very large and a very famous family with relatives like bamboo and wheat, rice, barley, and millet. And for a long time, everyone was happy, but the family kept growing and growing. And soon they realized that one family castle just couldn't hold this growing group. And so they had to divide the kingdom and the phylum and the family into subfamilies. So Teosinte was given this nice little cottage in the woods near Oaxaca, Mexico to share with its closest cousins like switchgrass and sorghum and the favorite of all the land, the sugar cane, who was always sweet, but often had slightly evil tendencies. Teosinte was adventurous and loved to get outside the cottage to play. She especially loved spending time with her friends squash and beans. Teosinte would allow the beans to climb up on her branches and then squash would stretch out her wide leaves to provide the cool shade on the ground for the bean to play in the soil and enrich it. This friendship will last a long time to the present day, in fact, and even though these plants aren't related, 
they will over time come to be known as the Three Sisters. About 9,000 years ago, when this story begins, Teosinti soon learns that she is not just an ordinary plant, and she soon will discover that just how complex and magical she is, magical enough to change the entire world. But first, she just learns that Teosinte isn't her name alone. She shares the name with all of the grasses in the genus Zea, which is a word from the Greek uh, for the uh, way across the world, uh, which was originally given to the European cousin called Spelt. And then she learned that she also has long lost sisters in the New World, species of Zea that are all native to the Americas. And she finds out that they're all pretty rare, rare enough that they're all threatened and endangered. And um, she also learns that they all share very important ecological traits like nitrogen fixation and insect resistance and they're perennials and they tolerate floods. So we can introduce you to Teosinte sisters. First, there's diploperennial Teosinte, who must have shown hubris to the gods who punished her by giving her the name diploperennial Teosinte. Uh, there's also Nicaraguan Teosinte, uh, perennial Teosinte, and Florida Teosinte, all again under the genus Zea. But the hero in our story today is called Zea Maiz, or often just Maiz or Maize. And um, this is what Maize looked like for our once upon a time uh, way back in Oaxaca when humans began to domesticate the wild Teosinte plant. And this picture was taken recently at the Ethnobotanical Gardens in Oaxaca City uh, because Teosinte is still around today. So now, um, we can, if we look at this, it looks like a fairly ordinary, ordinary grass. It has a single short row of kernels that are stacked atop each other, and each seed is sealed in its own shell. So if we were to harvest this grass and these seeds to eat, it would require a lot of work for very little nutrition, uh, because to get to the nutritious part, one has to remove a very tough casing, just as we have to remove the chaff from grains like wheat and barley and rice. But uh, it, remember, Teosinti is, is far from ordinary. And it, one of the most unique characteristics is that if you dry the seed, it retains a fairly high moisture content so that if you heat a dried Teosinti seed, it pops. It pops right out of that tough shell. And if that's not foreshadowing, I don't know what is, but it's possible that um, that this is how the earliest humans prepared maize. So you could imagine a scenario where people are sitting around a fire and on purpose or on accident, somebody throws a teosinte uh, grain into the fire for the world's first popped corn. And the earliest humans in the Americas produced some of the most advanced societies the world has ever seen. And they were very well versed in the domestication of plants and the production of varieties through selective breeding. So if they noticed this popped corn with a rich smell and taste, uh, that could have been enough motivation to start selectively breeding them, uh, which again, the humans at the time had very advanced knowledge of. So they likely started selectively breeding the, the Teosinte plants that produced the most rows of seeds. Uh, and, and you can see that in this native variety here. It's still a little skimpy and each seed is still kind of encased in that hard sheath, but this is easier to work with than single seeds. Um, and you get this kind of prototype corn cob. Um, and that's important because it also starts making the plant worthwhile enough that, that humans can start to transport it as they're migrating through the Americas. And then eventually they selected for plants that grew seeds, more seeds in rows out of a central cob. And you have your original, your, your OG maize on the cob. So more seeds, and just as importantly, you can see that this, they start selecting for plants uh, with thinner outer shells, and then the seeds start to peek through that tough coating um, that could be really hard on our teeth. So uh, this means more seeds, easier to get to, less work to free the seeds by the humans. And then over time, eventually selective breeding led to cobs with many more seeds 
that grew fully popped out of those shells on their own. Um, and they're all enclosed by one husk. So instead of preparing each seed individually, we now just have to shuck the husk off the cob to access hundreds of seeds at once. And it's possible and, and could be likely that this transformation happened in a relatively short period, again, because of the agricultural knowledge possessed by Mesoamericans. And I just, I can't stress enough how important this process is to the history of humanity. Charles Mann in his wonderful book, 1491, thank you, Robin, it states that the, the Neolithic revolution, which is the invention of farming essentially, is so important that archeologists pretty much can divide human history into just two parts, everything before the Neolithic revolution and everything after it, that's how important it was. And most history books will tell us that the Neolithic revolution began 11,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East in, in what's modern day Iraq, Israel, and Turkey, uh, where humanity learned to cultivate and breed grains like wheat and barley, which led to permanent villages, which led to the wheel, metal tools, writing, etc. And you would think that the Americans had missed out on this because they were long gone by then, but there were already thriving native populations in the Americas who independently went through an equally, if not more impactful Neolithic revolution uh, through the domestication of plants like squash and beans and avocados and maize. And if you focus on the species that were domesticated in each place, the old world and the new world, if you start in the old world, you have, again, you have wheat, you have rice, you have millet and barley, all undeniably extremely important to humanity. But all of those plants, uh, the plants that produce those grains today look pretty similar to the wild ancestors that we domesticated. And even the plants today are, uh, they're, they're highly productive on their own. They're highly, the, the old plants, uh, the ancestral plants are also highly productive and also edible. And, um, all of the plants that produce those grains today still can reproduce by themselves without human intervention. So we still intervene to, to make yields bigger, but on their own, those crops could, could just continue to produce. So that was all again, super important, um, but it wasn't that big of an agricultural step to do that domestication process. But the leap from teosinte grass to maize or corn is, is absolutely monumental. So man says that in creating modern maize from this unpromising teosinte plant, Mesoamerican Indians performed a feat that was so improbable. Um, and, and archeologists and biologists today are still arguing and they've been arguing for so long for, for how they could have achieved that. And it really wasn't until the last few decades that we really began to understand the process. Um, and, you know, modern maize looks nothing like its wild ancestor. The wild ancestor produced very little food um, and modern maize plants cannot reproduce on their own uh, without the help of humans because the seeds are so tightly wrapped up in that husk that they wouldn't reproduce on their own. So it took a lot of human ingenuity to, to both develop and then maintain this improbable transition. And when you combine corn with squash, beans and avocados, uh, one could argue that the Mesoamerican Neolithic revolution uh, was both more agriculturally advanced, but it also produced a healthier and more balanced diet than the equivalent in the old world. Uh, another really important development from the plant itself that really allowed for this has to do with biology. So like squash, maize plants have separate male and female flowers. The pollen is produced on the top of the plant and then the female silk is, is further down on the stalk. So this makes it easier for agriculturists, past and present, to control the cross breeding of favored traits. They can control which plants have things that they like, and then they can breed them with other plants that have that trait. Um, and that's done through hand pollination. Uh, it's extremely likely that, that the Mesoamericans hand pollinated the plants, again, based on the characteristics they wanted, and then that's still practiced today as pollen can be collected with bags and then brushed on the silk below. Um, so in addition to make it easier, this 
arrangement also allows for better and more efficient yields of crops than if a field were left on its own uh, to wind to pollinate, uh, which does happen uh, to a lesser extent. So what we have today in maize is a grain that has the widest growing latitude of any grain on earth. It's grown from Lima, Peru, all the way up to Southern Canada. There is more nutrition because of this agricultural development over millennia. There's more nutrition in a single kernel of corn today than there is in an entire Teosinte plant. There are an incredible number of varieties that are adapted to different soil conditions, different temperature ranges, different rain patterns, uh, water availability, day length. You have early season varieties, late season, different colors and shapes, some that are best prepared, boiled, roasted, dried, ground into flour. And it's pretty amazing that all these varieties still to this day can be crossed with each other and can be crossed with the original Teosinte plant. Part of the reason that corn and many other plants can be so adaptable is essentially because they can't move. Um, if conditions change for an animal that can move, um, they, they can move to somewhere that's more favorable, but plants are kind of stuck where they're growing. And so they really need to adapt or perish. And so um, even though corn has only 10 pairs of chromosomes compared to the 23 and me that humans have, uh, corn has 32,000 genes compared to the 20,000 or so in humans. And here's a, a kind of basic hand drawing from Margaret Hardin's podcast uh, webpage that looks at the, the likely journey based on recent evidence of domesticated corn. Again, starting with the, the migration of people from Oaxaca to the south. Uh, they, they moved both west and east of the Andes in South America and got there about 1500 years after the journey started. Uh, then corn and people moved east to the Orinoco and then kind of took two paths up to North America. One was uh, on the east of the Orinoco up through the Lesser Antilles to the Yucatan. And then another was uh, west through Colombia and uh, Cuba, Venezuela and the, and the Greater Antilles. So at, the, at about the year zero, which is the start of the common era, maize is also being traded quite a bit. So it's, it's not necessarily, doesn't need people to move with it. It's gonna start moving through the trade and um, it makes its way into the Southwest of the US and then eventually up to the Plains and the Mississippian societies uh, that are here in our part of the world. <clears throat> and, and corn is added to uh, some staples that, are already been, that have already been domesticated up here like sunflower seed was very important and uh, goosefoot plants like amaranth and quinoa. Um, and, and Margaret Hardin stresses that where corn thrived, you have monumental cultures uh, produced from the Aztec and Maya and the Inca and Olmec in South America to the Anastasi and Pueblos in the Southwest to the Mississippians that produced the great mounds of Cahokia and closer to home here in Wisconsin at Aztalan. So there are many, many different cultures that are enjoying maize that are producing new varieties of maize and are experimenting with how to prepare maize. So we're at about 9,000 years after the once upon a time started and, and most of us recognize maize from a few varieties that we call corn on the cob. So when Columbus brought the first ears of corn to Isabella, he called it maize, which is what the Arawak people in the Caribbean called it. And most European languages still call it maize. So in French, it's maize, in Spanish, it's maize, in Italian, it's maize, in German, it's maize, but because the English are English, they called it Indian corn or later just corn, uh, which, which is really strange because English in English, corn means grain. So wheat, barley, rye, and oats are all types of corn. And during the 1890s famine in Ireland, the corn laws had actually nothing to do with corn. They had to do with wheat, barley, and oats. So in my opinion, it's kind of like if you were, let's say you're already drinking milk and water and juice. And then somebody discovers iced tea and everybody calls it iced tea, but we're gonna call this new thing beverage. So I, something along those lines, it's a little strange, but in any case, uh, this is what popular varieties of corn look like 
by the time of European conquest. So we still have to shuck the husk and um, the individual seeds still have that hardy shell called the pericarp, but which is different from that protective shell that we lost through selective breeding. So the pericarp protects, uh, sometimes called the hull, protects the endosperm and the germ. Uh, the endosperm is the starch and the germ is the seed. So when corn is fresh, we can actually just go ahead and consume it. Uh, I actually prefer, I like eating corn raw uh, right off the cob. I also enjoy it boiled or roasted or prepared in just about any way, but um, I'm not picky. I even like candy corn. So um, we can easily enjoy corn fresh apart from the husking, which is very different from, from the, what we would have had to do for the teosinte plant. But when corn is dried, that outer pericarp, uh, that protective layer becomes very hard and it must be removed for us to eat it. So it's why popcorn is one of, one of the more dangerous foods to eat from a dental health professional field because if you accidentally crunch down on an unpopped seed uh, that has that healthy hole still in place, um, it's easy to crack a tooth. If you heat dried corn seed, uh, just like when you heat the teosinte seed, the trapped moisture starts to steam in the seed, which puts tremendous pressure on the hard pericarp until the corn pops. And then I was wondering what happened to that hard part of the seed. It's still there, right? It just popped open. But actually, in the process, uh, the, the hard part of the seed is actually chemically transformed into a gelatinous structure that our teeth can handle you know, for the most part until it gets stuck between our teeth and we have to floss it out. Um, which brings me to another question. If, if you use floss to get popcorn out of your teeth, what do you use to get floss if the floss is stuck in your teeth? Do you use popcorn? I don't know. In any case, popping corn is the is is one of many many ways to consume corn and to deal with that hard shell. Um, and there's the popcorn. Another method is to simply crush. This is one of the simplest methods: is to simply crush the dried seeds into cornmeal. Um, and sometimes people will do this in a process where you remove that pericarp, but you really don't need to because uh, the later processes of, of cooking and rendering will make that hard pericarp uh, digestible. It, it, but, but it's why we don't eat raw cornmeal because it still has those pieces of that hard part in it. A coarse grind of dried untreated seeds produces uh, dishes like grits, uh, which can be used um, to make the American delicacy we called frosted flakes as well. A medium grind of corn produces polenta, which is a word that describes both the cornmeal and the dish that you make out of it by adding water and salt and sometimes butter and cheese. So the medium to finer grain grinds are also used to make um, things like cornbread. And now we have reached our, um, let me just see, our first commercial break here. Oh, sorry, except for this part. So this is another, the, the, the finest, um, grind of corn makes corn flour, uh, which can also be used in, in many, many recipes. So uh, we've taken corn from teosinte to fresh dried and ground corn. And um, now we'll turn to a favorite of mine, Josh Clark from Stuff You Should Know uh, for a little bit of knowledge about eating corn. And I apologize for the, if you, if, if you can hear that outside, somebody is, uh, Pumping up a single stroke engine outside the window here. All right. You can't hear. Oh, good. Okay. And so here's Josh. Hey there, and welcome to Don't Be Dumb. I'm Josh Clark. Thank you for joining me. Have you ever wondered why sometimes when you eat corn, it comes out looking exactly like it went in? It turns out that that's because humans can't digest a lot of the corn. See, 
a corn, the corn that you eat is actually a bunch of seeds, delicious ones. And on the very, very center of the seed is what's called the germ. And the germ is going to eventually become the corn plant. Then around the germ is what's called the starch. And that's the part of the corn that you actually eat. And then around that is what's called the hull. And the hull is made from cellulose. The thing is, humans like you can't digest cellulose. We don't have the enzymes to digest it and the bacteria in our guts can't digest it either, which makes it indigestible. So if you don't chew the corn up enough to really mash down the hole, then it will pass through your digestive system intact. And it will make it all the way. But that's not such a bad thing. All of that undigested corn hull can accumulate and make your poop bumpy, which gives it traction and can really clean you out. And if you pooped in a meadow and a corn kernel survived intact, then that kernel would protect the germ inside and a corn plant could grow using your poop as a growing medium. So the next time somebody tells you that it's bad if corn shows up in your poop, you set them straight and tell them Josh sent you. Thank you for joining me. Do you have a suggestion for an episode of Don't Be Dumb? Leave it in the comments below. You can also like this video or subscribe or share it. I don't care. felt since uh, I'm not doing like copyright laws to share that I figured I'd, I'd let them make their advertisement uh, to like their videos. Okay. Um, so let's see, where were we? Um, another thing that's really important to note here, and it's why I have a cow and a llama, is that in addition to those indigestible parts of corn um, that, that Josh was talking about, uh, Corn on its own does not produce a complete diet because it, mainly because it's missing a very important B vitamin called niacin. And a niacin deficiency can lead to a disease called pellagra. Uh, and so if you only rely on fresh and dried corn, uh, which, which happened to a lot of the, the pilgrims, you, you really are missing some of those essential vitamins. So if you supplement corn with beans and meat and eggs and dairy, you really don't need to worry about it. Or if you are a llama or a cow, you can chew your cut over and over again uh, and the multiple stomachs, and you can then eventually tease out and digest the missing vitamins from the cellulose. Um, so they can live on a diet of corn, uh, whether that's good or not, but, but we humans to the best of my knowledge only have one stomach. And so many of the cultures that adopted corn also adopted a process, a very important process called nixtamalization to get around this issue. So this is a process of taking dried corn seeds and then soaking and cooking them in an alkaline solution, a very basic solution of around peach of 11, and then washing and agitating the seeds to remove the pericarp. Uh, when you do that, then you're also releasing niacin and you're releasing some of the vitamins that we need. Uh, the product of this process, the end result is called homily to most of us, and it's called nixtamali in the Aztec language, Nahuatl. So nixta refers to the alkali limestone, the lye, 
that's used in the process. And then the tamale is probably a, a familiar word to most of us based on, on what we're eating. Uh, it's pretty crazy that people came up with this method in addition to all the craziness of the other stuff that they developed. But actually the process of soaking food in lye has appeared many times throughout history across the world. Uh, from the simple things like curing olives in the Mediterranean. Uh, on my honeymoon in Turkey, I found an olive tree and I took a bite out of a fresh olive and it was one of the worst things I've ever eaten. It was absolutely super, super bitter. But somehow someone figured out that if we soak olives in lye, it removes that bitterness. And how they did that is beyond me. But then again, the Swedes said, hey, let's soak our fish in lye to make lutefisk, uh, thereby completely ruining everything that we love about fish and turning it into a jelly. And up until now, I thought the Swedes had taken the cake, so to speak, and producing disgusting food. But I just heard about something called century eggs from Taiwan, also known as pidan which are essentially eggs soaked in lye. And century eggs recently got the distinction of being named the world's most disgusting delicacy by Forbes. But I'm not here to judge at all. And if it's ever presented to me, I will most likely try it just like I tried fermented shark in Iceland and Vegemite in Australia. But for whatever reason, corn soaked in lye produces something that is absolutely delicious. The most common materials that are used to make the lye uh, is also a product of last week's topic or a byproduct of last week's topic, wood ash. So when you burn wood and the ash, the ash that's left behind is really quite basic, quite alkaline. And then when mixed with water that produces the lye that is perfect for soaking and cooking corn. Uh, some communities use lime or limestone rock that they heat over a fire and then drop into the cooking vessel to make the lye. When the nixtamalization process is complete, the grains become, as I said, nixtamali or something many of us call hominy. Now, hominy, hominy is entirely different than dried corn um, and is super important for our story in many ways. So first of all, hominy is an excellent way to store corn uh, because the seeds can no longer germinate after the process. And so things like molds and mildews can't grow on stored hominy. When you're storing simple dried corn, the seeds can germinate, germ coming from the seed, uh, and grow potentially dangerous molds. But even if you did take some moldy dried corn and turned it into homily, that process um, kills off the molds and removes a lot of the to toxins that might have been left behind. So it's, it's a pretty, it's a good process for making the corn safe. Um, homily is also much more nutritious than dried corn uh, because the process makes available the niacin and other nutrients our bodies can't process in fresh or dried corn. Um, so now we don't have to grow extra stomachs and we don't have to worry about those vitamin deficiencies. And nixtamalized homily produces deeper flavors and nicer textures for cooking, according to many. So there are a lot of wonderful dishes that are made from hominy, like pozole and uh, wonderful stews and soups and drinks. Uh, one of my absolute favorite drinks from my time in Bolivia was a delicious uh, hot beverage made from hominy known as api, and it was just absolutely delicious. More people drink that than, than coffee and tea. And just like with cornmeal, you can grind hominy to produce grits and breads. And if you grind it into a fine flour, you produce something called masa flour. And masa flour produces a creamier dough than cornmeal, and it's easier to work with because uh, it hangs together as a dough much better than cornmeal. And masa flour is used to make delicious and familiar things like tortillas, uh, gorditas, and tamales. So that is kind of a very condensed, once upon a time, telling one tiny sliver about the history of corn. There are entire books and documentaries written on the subject, uh, on the natural history, the social history, and how corn has affected the world. Uh, I didn't even talk about penicillin or whiskey or corn oils or corn fuels. Um, and I haven't touched uh, at all really what happens with corn kind of post-European conquest, uh, mainly because it is very complex um, and sensitive, but I will address it in a couple of ways. So first we'll watch a short TED video that delves into some of these other topics.
Corn currently accounts for more than one-tenth of our global crop production. The United States alone has enough cornfields to cover Germany. But while other crops we grow come in a range of varieties, over 99% of cultivated corn is the exact same type, yellow dent number two. This means that humans grow more yellow dent number two than any other plant on the planet. So how did this single variety of this single plant become the biggest success story in agricultural history? Nearly 9,000 years ago, corn, also called maize, was first domesticated from teosinte, a grass native to Mesoamerica. Teosinte's rock-hard seeds were barely edible, but its fibrous husk could be turned into a versatile material. Over the next 4,700 years, farmers bred the plant into a staple crop with larger cobs and edible kernels. As maize spread throughout the Americas, it took on an important role, with multiple indigenous societies revering a corn mother as the goddess who created agriculture. When Europeans first arrived in America, they shunned the strange plant. Many even believed it was the source of physical and cultural differences between them and the Mesoamericans. However, their attempts to cultivate European crops in American soil quickly failed, and the settlers were forced to expand their diet. Finding the crop to their taste, maize soon crossed the Atlantic, where its ability to grow in diverse climates made it a popular grain in many European countries. But the newly established United States was still the corn capital of the world. In the early 1800s, different regions across the country produced strains of varying size and taste. In the 1850s, however, these unique varieties proved difficult for train operators to package and for traders to sell. Trade boards in rail hubs like Chicago encouraged corn farmers to breed one standardized crop. This dream would finally be realized at 1893's World's Fair, where James Reed's Yellow Dent Corn won the Blue Ribbon. Over the next 50 years, Yellow Dent Corn swept the nation. Following the technological developments of World War II, mechanized harvesters became widely available. This meant a batch of corn that previously took a full day to harvest by hand could now be collected in just five minutes. Another wartime technology, the chemical explosive ammonium nitrate, also found new life on the farm. With this new synthetic fertilizer, farmers could plant dense fields of corn year after year without the need to rotate their crops and restore nitrogen to the soil. While these advances made corn an attractive crop to American farmers, U.S. agricultural policy limited the amount farmers could grow to ensure high sale prices. But in 1972, President Richard Nixon removed these limitations while negotiating massive grain sales to the Soviet Union. With this new trade deal and World War II technology, corn production exploded into a global phenomenon. These mountains of maize inspired numerous corn concoctions. Corn starch could be used as a thickening agent for everything from gasoline to glue, or processed into a low-cost sweetener known as high-fructose corn syrup. Maize quickly became one of the cheapest animal feeds worldwide. This allowed for inexpensive meat production, which in turn increased the demand for meat and corn feed. Today, humans eat only 40% of all cultivated corn, while the remaining 60% supports consumer good industries worldwide. Yet the spread of this wonder crop has come at a price. Global water sources are polluted by excess ammonium nitrate from corn fields. Corn accounts for a large portion of agriculture-related carbon emissions, partly due to the increased meat production it enables. The use of high-fructose corn syrup may be a contributor to diabetes and obesity. And the rise of monoculture farming has left our food supply dangerously vulnerable to pests and pathogens. A single virus could infect the world's supply of this ubiquitous crop. Corn has gone from a bushy grass to an essential element of the world's industries. But only time will tell if it has led us into a maze of unsustainability. Did you know cheese is one of humanity's oldest foods? You gouda be kidding me. 
No wonder it's so smelly. This lesson on the history of cheese will blow your rind. Watch it to end this onslaught of terrible puns. I wanted to end, since we just celebrated Thanksgiving by acknowledging really how complex this holiday is, the narrative is, is way more complex, full of struggle and subjugation, and, and really the best way we can all honor this complexity uh, is to listen to new narratives. And uh, Jenny just sent some great resources, uh, including an article by Learning for Justice about, about teaching Thanksgiving in a socially responsible way. So this is one of many resources out there. Uh, and we all grow smarter and better when we listen to new voices. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. And I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs>